Welcome to Building Tomorrow, a show exploring the ways that tech, innovation, and entrepreneurship are creating a freer, wealthier, and more peaceful world. As always, I'm your host, Paul Matsko, and with me in the studio today are Aaron Powell, the director of libertarianism.org, and our special guest, Caleb Watney, a tech policy fellow at the R Street Institute. Welcome to the show, Caleb. Thanks for having me on, Paul. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, now, today we have Caleb on to talk with us about artificial intelligence, you know, the tech that's behind the global overlord Sky. Net, responsible for sending Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, back in time to serve as a meta joke on Californians and as a cautionary tale about 1980s pop culture. We actually will talk about AI researchers' concerns about hostile AIs in a bit, but first let's start by talking about the ongoing implementation of less, shall we say, apocalypse-prone AI and the ways it's benefiting human society right now. So, Caleb, why don't you kick us off? Uh, what is AI? How does that differ or similar to other phrases that are commonly used in the field like machine learning or algorithmic learning or algorithms? Uh, what, what is that? Yeah. So I think if you get, you know, 10 AI researchers in a room and ask them, what is the definition of AI? You're going to get nine or 10 different answers. Um, it is a famously sort of divisive question. Um, personally, I, I tend to take a pretty broad definition of it. I, I think it's helpful as a category for, for the really broad range of things that are automating aspects of human decision making. Um, and so I think that would incorporate most forms of software. That's like a really low... Uh, form of, of artificial intelligence and go all the way up to really complicated, you know, machine learning algorithms. Um, and so uh, some other terms like machine learning are then subsets of AI to get you further up. I, I think if you think of just intelligence as um, a way for an agent to apply a complex, you know, or varied sorts of solutions to a problem they're trying to solve, the greater their ability to change the kinds of methods they use, the more intelligent the agent is. And so thinking of intelligence as this, you know, scale rather than like a binary that you are artificially intelligent or you're not tends to be a more helpful framework for me at least. The, what's machine learning? So machine learning is sort of the ability uh, to train uh, machines to kind of pick up patterns in the data themselves. Um, so if you give it, you know, like some search function as an algorithm and like a large supply of data and it's starting to like learn from the data and recognize patterns itself and, and pull those out, um, that's kind of in a very broad sense what, what machine learning is all about. So it's like my spam filter. Yeah, your spam filter is a great example of, of machine learning because you will frequently give it, you know, hints and lessons and that's part of how it learns, you know, to get better at, at tagging things as spam or not is you're saying, hey, this is an example of spam. This is not an example of spam. It tries to put all those uh, examples together, see what commonalities they have, what differentiates spam in your mind, and of course, what other humans think. Uh, and that helps slowly update its priors about what it's going to categorize as spam or not. This is why, Aaron, you haven't lost the fortune uh, to a Nigerian businessman since the mid 90s, uh, your spam filter uh, helping you out there. Um, it, it, what it reminds me of too is I like that n n non-binary approach, right? It's like it's like robots. Uh, you know, those who grew up uh, uh, in the 1950s or 60s, you said robot, they thought, um, uh, the, you know, something from 50s sci-fi television, like you know the what's one with the alien? They land in like Central Park, and the alien comes out. Um, big, the day the earth stood still. The day the earth stood still, right? Classic sci-fi. Um, that's a robot, a fully autonomous, and or usually anthropoid, you know. Uh, metal man. Well, but robots are all around us, right? They, they build our cars. They're, uh, there's a gradation of, of robotics. Yeah, and, exactly. um, and the same thing being true for artificial intelligence is, uh, I think, a useful uh, starting point. So now you mentioned pattern recognition. Uh, the first thing that came to mind was uh, that episode of Silicon Valley where it was hot dog or not a hot dog. <laughs> Remember that? So pretty good. That, and, and you can actually download an app, as I understand, someone wrote a program and you can actually make sure something's not a hot dog before you bite into it, or I guess you want to make sure it is a hot dog. Um, so pattern recognition, pretty good, though there is that conundrum. Um, one of our columnists, uh, Kate Sills, in a piece on smart contracts, noted that like there's an issue uh, with uh, th th there's a meme going around about recognizing the difference between a dog and a muffin. And even some of our smartest um, algorithms can't pick up the difference. The, the pattern's just not dissimilar enough. They can't tell a chihuahua from a brand muffin. Um, 
So they're still even, I mean, they're, they're doing better than we would have thought even just a couple of years ago, but there's still an issue there. On this pattern recognition, so the, the value of recognizing a dog from a muffin is not because the AI can now do something that we can't. It's that it can do it at scale, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It can it find, so Google image search can find us pictures of dogs and know not to give us pictures of muffins and all that. Uh, but it seems like, I mean, a lot of the more valuable uses of machine learning or of AIs becoming good at pattern recognition is to find stuff that we weren't able to find, to identify patterns that that we couldn't identify by looking at lots of data or, you know, looking, we're going to try to use AI to figure out what the potential causes of certain health ailments are. So we're using it for research as opposed to automation. How do you do that though? Because as you said, like with the spam filter, the way my spam filter works is, and I, I used to have in, in the 90s, I had one called, God, I can't even remember, spam pop file, I think it was, that you, you installed on your own computer and routed your mail through it and it just used a Bayesian filter. And so you just trained it just over time and it got, it got remarkably good. Um, but that required me training it. So how do you get an AI to be good at something that like by definition we can't train it on? Yeah. So there, there's a bunch of different techniques that machine learning researchers will use to try to improve the functionality. When humans are sort of like directly involved in in telling, you know, the, the algorithm, this is a good thing to do, this is not a good thing, that's usually called supervised, uh, you know, machine learning. And unsupervised is when you're you're trying to give it some more, more automated function. So as an example, um, OpenAI has a number of, of different programs that will try to learn various games. And so they have one that learned how to play chess. And uh, counter to how you know previous algorithms have learned to play chess, which is usually from like watching a whole bunch of human games, uh, having computer or humans you know program into it. These are the kinds of strategies you should be looking for. Rather, it just had the the algorithm play another version of itself uh, for billions of hours, and that slowly taught it to become you know better. And, and obviously, it could learn you know slowly as, as it played you know billions of games that these kinds of moves uh, increase the probability of winning. These ones don't. And just kind of through that brute force, it was able to come up with patterns and strategies and techniques that humans hadn't even thought of. Um, and so today in, in chess tournaments, uh, one way that you might be able to find out if a human is cheating and using uh, you know, a computer to help them is if their move seems too original. Because uh, <laughs> if, if their move is, is too original, then it's unlikely that like a human you know, would have discovered that yeah, already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Huh, that's really smart, actually. Um, well, and it's a reminder. Uh, you're looking for deviation from kind of a from a norm, um, w which is what pattern matching and and the ability to go through that many calculations a, a second allow you to do. Um, uh, some of the applications are really quite exciting. We did a episode on uh, DNA databases, uh, things like uh, Ancestry.com, 23andMe. And uh, when we were discussing that, 23andMe had just signed a deal with GlaxoSmithKline, a major pharmaceutical company. And their goal, I mean, they're years away from this, but their goal is to use um, AI to look at genetic markers. And you know, so for each person, there are so many different genetic variants on your basic chromosome, chromosome that like to actually parse through that for a real doctor, a specialist to parse through that would just be impossible. It's just too much volume. It can be done. So if you can train the AI to look through someone's entire genetic code and look for these patterns and maybe look for patterns that even people haven't picked up on yet and then take a basic prescription, tweak it for that individual person, you can make the drug more effective potentially than the, 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 the generic variation. You can make it uh, have you know, fewer, the, the sim fewer symptoms, have a lower symptom rate. Um, there's some really cool, exciting stuff just using that basic pattern recognition pro and, and the ability to just absorb vacuum up data like that. Yeah, I think one weird thing we're seeing is there are a whole bunch of, you know, potentially interesting applications that we don't have access to right now because the search costs uh, for for you know sorting through so much information is just too high, and so you know trying to run individual clinical trials to see how you know this specific drug interacts on you know these fifteen different types of genomes or whatever that's just like unfeasible. You can't run clinical trials on on that many things. Um, but if you can sort of you know model what that would look like ahead of time uh, you know on a computer, and then you can run you know billions of simulations beforehand, you can find which you know 
possible solutions are going to be the most promising and then run human clinical trials on those. Um, and so it's really, I think, just expanding out the uh, you know production frontier of uh, what are our search costs? Like how expensive is it to search for new, uh, really informational, intense solutions? Hmm. That's really cool. So you've written about so – there's, so this, there's the pattern recognition side of AI, but there's also the kind of decision process automation side of it where it's like make a decision for me so yeah. I don't have to go through that process or you can do it faster or maybe you can do it more accurately. And you wrote a while back about one that seems incredibly counterintuitive, was kind of interesting, which was criminal justice. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit about how we might use AI in criminal justice? Sure. Um, and, and kind of to take a step back on what's the broader point here, yeah, AI tends to be very useful for pattern recognition um, and then also in automating or helping us sort of create a more rigorous model for how we think through decisions ourselves. Um, so the specific example in criminal justice is in pretrial uh, detention uh, decisions, uh, where essentially a judge has to uh, look at, but before the trial, they have to decide: Is this defendant, uh, you know, going to have to post bail? Are they going to, you know, just be released without bail? Are there going to be various levels of community surveillance? Or if we think that they're, you know, a very big risk of either running away before their trial or committing another crime before their trial, uh, you know, we can uh, keep them in pretrial detention, um, and that as a portion of like how large. You know the population is incarcerated. Um, jail is, has been a large portion of that, especially in, in the growth in the last 20, 30 years. And so, and, and constitutionally, these are people that are still innocent. You know, because they're innocent before proven guilty. Um, and so, it's really just kind of like a fundamentally a risk prediction of what's the likelihood of them, you know, uh, leaving town before the trial or or committing another crime. And it seems like we have pretty good indication that judges are very bad at making those kinds of predictions. Um, they'll systematically underrate the risk of you know, the very high risk uh, defendants, and they'll systematically overrate the risk of very low risk defendants. And so um, by just having more accurate predictions about what is that likelihood, you can get, I think, simultaneously lower crime rates uh, and uh, lower jail populations. If we're going to have minority re minority report, it might as well be an effective minority report. Well, <laughs> so this is so that last weekend I I watched. But this is before I knew we were having this conversation. I watched an episode of Rift Tracks on Amazon Prime, and the the movies was the um, new version of Mr. Science Theater uh, was called Cyber Tracker. <laughs> Um, it was a vehicle for Don the Dragon Wilson, who was a short-lived martial arts star, and it was it was terrible. But the whole premise was there's this company that ha is replacing judges with AI, um, and there's then evil senators in cahoots with them, and then lots of kicking. Uh, <laughs> but but that everyone that everyone was up in arms about this, right? Because this is, you know, like you're taking away our humanity. Yeah. And that seems like a real, I mean, that's a concern not just with this, but with a lot of the the AI stuff that we've talked about. It, it shows up in autonomous vehicles too, that we, you know, it, we seem to be perfectly happy with getting plowed into by drunk drivers all the time. But if we're going to get plowed into a whole lot less by a computer, just because it's a computer, that's, that's way worse than yeah. the mindless humans doing it. Um, so how do we... Is that inevitable? Is there is there something we can do to get around that? Um, and and how much do you think that limits really effective and positive change in both the near and long term? Yeah, I think it's worth differentiating um, between situations where you know it, it may be more likely that the computer completely replaces the human, uh, which seems you know more likely in autonomous vehicles and drivers, um, versus times when the AI can partner with humans and improve human decision making, which seems more likely in the case of judges. Um, so you know we're not recommending or advocating here that we you know uh, remove all human judges from the courtroom and we just let algorithms sort everything out. Um, it's about trying to give them more accurate baselines of risk. And so you know judges are implicitly making these decisions already subconsciously. You know they're looking at the defendant, they're looking at their rap sheet, what they've been accused of, what's their background, have they skipped crime before, and they're they're implicitly making a risk calculation already. And so. Human decision making, though, is incredibly volatile. We're subject to all sorts of biases. There's really good evidence that uh, you know judges, when their uh, undergraduate football team loses that weekend, uh, for that entire week, they're going to give harsher punishments um, or be more likely to incarcerate rather than let the defendant go. Um, and, and in many ways, algorithms allow us to systematize human decision making. You know, it, it's the process of when you write down the, the the process by which you're making a decision. 
it allows you to examine it externally, check it for bias in a way that you can't when it's all just happening in your head. Um, and so again, there, there's lots of aspects of human decision making that you can't capture in that process. But insofar as you, that can be, you know, in addition to the the more subjective parts of the criminal justice reasoning, um, I, I think it can be a tool that can improve outcomes. Yeah, well, especially if you have a situation, you know, th there will be uh, some people keep track of, you know, particularly. Um, uh, onerous and kind of infamous judges who will come up with inventive penalties, right? And, uh, you know, you have to wear a sign, stand on the corner and be like publicly shamed. And this is the judge that always shames people or like the, the kind of idiosyncrasies of, of, of judges, um, which is impervious to inspection, like you mentioned, right? You, you can't look inside the judge's mind and figure out exactly why they're making decisions they're making. You can pick up on patterns, and some of those patterns are real disturbing. Football teams, but racial, gender prejudice, you know, the subconscious bias will pop up fr frequently as well, that, you know, um, essentially uh, a, a black and a white, you know, defendant or, or, or um, in, uh, whatever, accused, will receive different bail assessment risks despite having a very similar profile otherwise, right? And like, so, but that process can't, you can't crack that. The, the human brain is a black box. Whereas an algorithm, it's designed by people. We come up with that, that algorithm, and at least in theory, and I know this gets into a question of like proprietary algorithms and all that, but in theory, that can be examined and it can be tweaked, it can be changed, it can be debated, it can be discussed in, in, the, in the public sphere. I I wonder how much of a check that would be, though. Like, I mean, so we just we just saw the the president of the United States tweet out that he's mad at Google's algorithms for privileging content that is linked to by a lot of people over content that is not. So he doesn't like Google's. I mean, Google doesn't publish its algorithms, but we all it's it's pretty easy to to read up on the basics, the gist of how they work. Um, here's it. Here's so an AI an algorithm that's surfacing news stories. We know how it works, and yet you've got a huge portion of the country up in arms because they don't know how it works and refuse to believe the people who have told you how it works. And so it's almost like we're just kind of – we feel like we might have a tendency to read all those biases we think that the AI is going to help us out with. We just read back into the AI's behavior <laughs> and then get mad at it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a serious problem. And that may be sort of you know reason for – some amount of humility about how fast some of this change is going to happen because there is a cultural change that needs to happen where, you know, I'm much more okay with the idea of not driving myself around and, you know, having an autonomous vehicle drive me around because I've grown up on like Uber and Lyft, you know, and it's really not that different. It's um, pretty condescending towards the people who drive you, the Uber and Lyft. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm just saying that that the sense of freedom attached to personal car ownership doesn't mean nearly as much to me as it does to my dad or some of my older colleagues. Um, and I think in the same way, you're going to see sort of a cultural shift where, you know, what freedom means becomes less about what you like owning the car and more can you get where you want when you want how you want like that that positive aspect to do that becomes the, the aspect of freedom and I would imagine that you're going to see similar cultural changes around uh, how okay are we are or how okay are we with algorithms making decisions and do we assign them you know similar levels of culpability as we do for humans or more well it's like with uh, we already um, you know most low low cost index funds have robo advisors you know we the ordinary middle class American person who has a 401k is trusting an algorithm with their life savings. Right. And like that was something that would have been kind of unimaginable 10, 20 years ago. And now it's just ordinary. So evolving cultural norms and expectations, I think. But there's always going to be a lag there. And that lag, things can get messy, you get a lot of distrust and, and trouble. Um, before we move on, uh, real quick. So we, we were moving towards bail, flight risk assessment and whatnot. But maybe a quick word, like what has the impact been? And I think my home state, I, I live in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think New Jersey was uh, leading the way in the in, in the kind of algorithm bail system. W w what have been the effects? Yeah. Um, so New Jersey took pretty broad sweeping actions uh, at the beginning of 2017. They they passed a bill that uh, completely got rid of cash bail um, and re instead replaced it with a risk assessment algorithm. Um, and so you know now judges have the option to either assign various levels of community surveillance. Um, you know, someone checking up on you once a week as far as like ankle monitoring would be like the highest level of community surveillance um, and 
overall, this has led to, I think, what was it, like 25, 28 percent decrease in the jail population since the legislation has gone into effect. Um, and it's, it's somehow it's, it's somewhat difficult to tease out how much of that is uh, getting rid of cash bail and adding more levels of community surveillance versus what is more accurate uh, risk prediction by the, the, the risk assessment algorithm. Um, but I think in some ways they almost go together. Uh, I, I think risk assessment algorithms politically enable certain types of criminal justice reform that wouldn't have been able – before, because if you, if you just told you know a population we're just gonna get rid of uh, you know bail and we're instead just gonna trust the judges to give you know community surveillance instead, I think a lot of people would have freaked out about that and not been willing to to vote for that. But if you give them sort of a semblance of we're placing cash bail with something actively that's gonna still try to assess risk in a somewhat objective manner, I, I think that enables new political possibilities that, that weren't available before. So oddly enough, it's almost like we're using as a political tool, we're taking advantage of people's blind trust in a, a technology that because it's new to most people is indistinguishable from magic. And you, you in an article, in a response article for Cato Unbound, you, you were talking about a kind of a fairy dust view of artificial intelligence. And so in a, in a funny way, we're basically saying, hey, it'll be okay if we get rid of bail because we'll sprinkle some magic fairy dust algorithm <laughs> on the assessment process so you can trust that it'll work out. Like, isn't that, isn't that a problem though, the, the fairy dust approach? I mean, I think there's there's different ways of selling it. I, I think the correct way to try to, to, to approach it is, is as a hammer. You know, it's a tool that you use for a very specific purpose. Um, and in this case, uh, we have pretty good evidence that humans are really bad at assigning risk. Algorithms seem to do a better job uh, in, in sort of the, the simulations that we have. Um, and so, so I think it makes sense. I mean, it may also subconsciously be kind of working on people's trust in technology, but I think just as much a factor on the other end, people are scared of new technology and don't want to go with something. I mean, so that may kind of cancel out to a certain extent. That's, that's a good point. Okay, so we, we made a nod towards the, the problem of proprietary algorithms, mm -hmm. uh, both for cash bail flight systems, but in other avenues. I mean, governments, uh, state governments, city governments, even the federal government are increasingly rolling out artificial intelligence for like national security, surveillance purposes, you know, to track yeah. you know, the facial tracking and, and, and all kinds of um, applications. What are some of the concerns that we should have um, as people who love freedom and liberty uh, about the state's use of artificial intelligence and, con you know, the, its contracts with private providers? Yeah. Um, and uh, and, and what, what kind of things should we be wary of in that regard? For sure. So I think a mistake I've, I've seen some people fall into is kind of to to assume that whenever the government is purchasing or using algorithms, uh, we should be holding them to the same to the same standards that we're holding private companies to. Um, and I think that's a mistake um, for for two main reasons. One, uh, usually the level of harm that the state is able to uh, do if it messes up is much higher than a private company. Um, obviously, private companies do not have the ability to send you to jail uh, if they you know choose to. Um, they don't have, you know, drones that have, you know, missiles on them. Um, yet. 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 <laughs> uh, you know, if Tinder makes a mistake, you end up going on a bad date. You know, that sucks, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, the level of harm associated with usually government uses of technology tend to be much higher. And two, there's, there's different sorts of feedback loops. Um, so private companies are usually in competition with other companies. Again, if going back to Tinder, if they set you up on bad dates consistently and there's an alternative that doesn't set you up on bad dates, you're able to switch to that. And that kind the, the knowledge that, you know, there's competition uh, inspires Tinder to, you know, be really careful about the way that their algorithm works, to constantly check it for, for bias or, or for, for data error and to improve it over time. Um, the government, though, you know, if I'm a defendant, I don't get to choose which jurisdiction I want to be tried mm -hmm. in based on mm -hmm. how much I like their risk assessment algorithm. Um, <laughs> and so there, there's not the same sort of feedback loop for improvement or for transparency or for accountability. And so um, I, I think you can totally justify stronger, if you want to call them regulations, uh, you can. But I, I think it's really just uh, the government using their contract power. Uh, they they are having procurement pro contracts with these private companies, and in the same way that that Google, if they're buying you know uh, from a third party uh, vendor, they're allowed to put whatever stipulations they want in their contract to ensure that it meets their standards. They have, I think, the government should be very willing to use um, the the incredible power they have in procurement contracts to make sure that they have you know full access to to check on the data uh, and make it accountable and to the public. I, my my brain turned off when I heard the word regulation. That's a dirty word around here. <laughs> I know, right? I know. Yeah, you heard your first Cato Institute in favor of regulation. <laughs> that's a, no, that's that that's a that's a good I think 
there's a lot of legitimate cautions there about the the state's use of AI. And like it'd be a mistake to only focus on the positive potential applications where we see them and you know have a cautionary note. So there there's some more um, some will say fantastical uh, concerns about super intelligent AIs with a hostile intent towards humankind. Uh, so why don't we dig into uh, two related concepts, uh, or at least they're, they're concepts that the, the, the first one here, the singularity developed first, and then someone proposed an interesting thought experiment called Rocco's Basilisk, and we'll talk about what that is second. So the singularity, um, it's built on the presumption that artificial intelligence will increase in intelligence at the same kind of exponential rate as uh, other areas of tech. Uh, most famously, uh, Moore's law about superconductor, um, the number of transistors you can fit in like a square, well, inch and a square millimeter. Now we're, we're talking about molecular level transistors. So that that curve, that basically super semiconductor chips will become more and more transistor den uh, dense and do so at essentially an exponential growing rate that the same thing will be true of artificial intelligence, which means that at some point, not only will artificial intelligences be indistinguishable from human intelligences, they will surpass us. And when that day comes, as they become smarter and smarter and smarter than us, more capable of out innovating us, that they might, I mean, th so there's a, there's a, uh, uh, optimistic use case for this, which is the idea that we'll have a machine learning introduced human utopia where machines will do for us better than what we can do for ourselves. There'll be the end of pain and suffering. We'll die. We'll upload our brains to the cloud. We'll and have- We have true communism. <laughs> we'll, we'll have true communism because clearly that's the, that is the only true utopia. Um, so there's the, there's the optimistic use case here. And it is worth noting this does kind of come out of golden age sci-fi in the, in the 40s, 50s. Um, this is when, I mean, it's not an accident that uh, Turing, Alan Turing, the famous Turing test, will you be able to tell, you know, one of the markers of the advancement of artificial intelligence will be if you can't distinguish a computer from a person in the conversation, which we still haven't actually passed. We can kind of fudge the test, but we're getting there, but we're not there yet. But it comes out of this post-World War II, a bunch of mathematicians, sci-fi geeks, and they, they come up with, hey, this could happen. They all expected it to happen in their lifetime, and obviously the pace has been slower than what was expected. But there again, there's this belief of a super intelligent AI that will surpass humankind intelligence. Um, this leads us to Rocco's Basilisk. Now, on, on this regard, um, I think, Aaron, you brought this to my attention. Yeah. Uh, what's your, how, how did you come across Rocco's Basilisk? It's been around for a little while. I have no idea, probably on Twitter or some blog, or it was something that everyone was talking about for um, a while. And I mean, very briefly, it's, um, it's simply the idea that a super intelligent AI can turn against us likely will turn against us in all sorts of ways, right? So if you if you task it with making the world a better place, do everything you can to make the world peaceful, well, the least peaceful thing on the planet is us pesky humans. And so, you know, it, at some point does it start, you know, it starts getting upset with with people who are are going against its its particular set of rules or people who are interfering with it advancing these. Um, and so that gets us to people who are not sufficiently positive about AI would be considered threats to this AI's accomplishment of its mission because if we're not sufficient, if we're not, society isn't all keen on AIs, that's going to slow things down, slow down advancement, whatever else. And so the AI might start picking off or otherwise punishing those people who have not, who have said nasty things about the possibilities of AI in the past. Um, and because these AIs will then have access to all of the information, because we, you know, if, if we're griping about AI, we're griping about AI on Twitter and that's there forever. Um, and so the AI will have access to that. And so then it will start going back and like, look, if you've been if you've been grouchy, Caleb, you've been saying nasty things about AI in the past, chances, I mean, it's better than an average chance you still harbor some of those uh, ill feelings. And so we might as well pick you off. And and so the, the kind of outcome of this thought experiment is we all better just say nothing nice about AI starting now. 
Yeah. So I, there's a whole range of kind of possible negative consequences that come about from a superintelligence. Um, it could be as simple as, uh, you know, it feels totally neutral towards humans, but we give it, you know, a poorly defined goal. Um, like the, the famous experiment is, or the famous thought experiment is a paperclip maximizer. If we just tell uh, an AI to maximize the number of paperclips uh, with no, you know, specified end goal or any sort of uh, conditions on that, eventually it will just, you know, slowly consume all matter in the universe, including all of us, and turn us into paperclips. And that's like, you know, one uh, category of possible harms from from superintelligence's poorly de- poorly defined goal systems. Um, I, Roku's basket is, is usually kind of specifically a malevolent AI, uh, which might come about. Uh, Aaron, as you alluded to, you know, it, it can search back in the the history of of various, you know, Twitter, podcasts, whatever, and. and um, if, if it feels that you were insufficiently devoted to bringing it about faster, it would then go back and either kill you or, if you're not alive, uh, re-simulate your mind and infinitely torture you in some computer simulation. Um, and so then, you know, for the purposes of avoiding this horrible fate, uh, we should all be, you know, focused and, and dedicating ourselves to helping bring about this malevolent eye so that when it exists, it doesn't torture us infinitely. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of you know, potential problems with it, but it's kind of a a fun and interesting thought experiment. I do often wonder with these conversations, the effect of, so there's kind of a selection effect when it comes to people who do AI research. I mean, I'm not, I'm not the first to observe that maybe the population of Silicon Valley is not representative of like humankind as a whole that lacks diversity and and not just in like the, you know, literal, literal ways, gender and, and race and religion and whatnot, but also in like, there's a kind of person who gravitates towards this kind of research who's maybe not the most like doesn't have the densest social connectedness right they're college educated they're they're mobile they're moving they're not rooted in place in in family and tribe and neighborhood and so that so my point in bringing this up is like part of me wonders if when we we worry about ai futures we're really looking in a mirror and so since you have perhaps a community of folks who are inclined towards a certain level, like on the spectrum of well-adjusted to sociopathy, <laughs> there's almost a, an inclination towards like, I don't, I don't really feel like I need people. Um, and so I'm worried that my AI that I designed won't feel a need for people as well. That like some of our concerns come out of the p- particular community. So, so the Rocco's Basilisk, it comes from Less Wrong, that's the name of the website, which is a big part of the rationalist community. You know, lots of the community I, I, I enjoy a lot, like Slate Star Codex, even Tyler Cowen that is uh, rationalist adjacent. Um, but again, it's a community that's known for, like there's almost uh, people as atomized individual units who who talk who you know who talk about u- utils like I'm gonna maximize my utils. Uh, what's the most efficient way I can ingest substances? So I'm gonna drink lots of soylent. Or like in other words, which is I mean to tie this into your your thesis is yeah. named after a product that's quite literally using other people <laughs> to feed yourself. Yeah. Yes, and someone that was supposed to be a bad thing in whatever '70s sci-fi movie that uh, was featured in. Um, soylent Green. Soylent Green. Yeah. Yeah, based okay. on the Harry Harrison novel "Make Room, Make Room." There we go. I knew you'd know your your, your sci-fi references. Um, that was meant to be a bad thing, but now it's been turned into a branding for a very successful consumer product, which is all <laughs> layers of irony. But again, maybe that's maybe there's something unusual unusual about the community that community that's doing a lot of AI research or AI is AI interested right now. And so that would be maybe an optimistic argument, which is to say that as AIs become not just a preserve of a hyper select sub you know subculture or small community, that our AIs will look more like people, which is there'll be some really good ones, some really shitty ones. It'll be the whole the whole gamut of humanity we reflect in our AIs. So I think a lot that kind of underlines this is is a lot of assumptions about what intelligence is and what it implies as you have increasing intelligence. Um, you know whether or not uh, you know personality or malevolence or benevolence are uh, you know inevitable consequences of increasing intelligence seems very unclear right now. Um, I would probably lean towards no. I mean, it, it seems like uh, th- there's a lot of things about human consciousness that we still don't understand from like a purely reductionist, uh, you know, perspective. And maybe we will find them out. Maybe we won't. Um, getting back to your, your earlier question, though, about is there there's something about these hypothetical philosophical thought experiments that come out of the community? 
I, I think there probably is. I, I think what it may be is generally as a community, they have a willingness to to bite bullets, you know, when they're thinking through about what are the logical consequences of uh, axioms X, Y, and Z. Um, and I, I think that that's an admirable trait, but it gets you to a lot of really crazy, uh, you know, circumstances about, you know, the entire universe being uh, devoted to computonium, you know, which is like the the, the hypothetical, you know, most efficient uh, processing, you know, unit per atom. Um, and I mean, maybe I think I think it's worth considering some of those, um, at least as like very small possibility events. Um, but it, it's also worth you know recognizing we have very poor pat track records in terms of actually being able to predict the future. It seems very likely that's going to continue. Um, and, and so having kind of like a epistemic humility about you know what's the actual likelihood that any of these things, even if you know from our specific axioms they seem entirely rational, um, I, I think it's good to take a step back. Raises one question I have about about AI and AI advancement because so the a, a lot of baked in assumption of this is that there's a super intelligence that comes out of this um, and and a lot of the AI that we interact with like my kids talk to Alexa all the time and Alexa is Alexa and Alexa lives in little pods throughout our house and may live in your houses but it still is it's Alexa right but a lot of these AIs are. They're not. It's not monolithic. There's. There might be the AI that drives my car, which only lives in that car, and there's a lot of the AI processing that goes on in my phone only happens in my phone because Apple does that for privacy reasons largely. Uh, so how is it a mistake to think that AI in the future will be even a big Super intelligence in the first place, or will it just always remain these kind of low level with you know that's not trying to do everything? Like it's this may be super intelligent, but its super intelligence only enables it to drive a car. And so even if it wanted to destroy the world, the most it could do is maybe run someone over if it could even think like that. But that is is like highly highly intelligence in very narrow domains. So I think. The, the sort of the biggest question about you know what future do we end up in is it you know a bunch of discrete AIs that are each you know industry specific or is there kind of one uh, you know amalgamation of, of an AI that controls everything? Uh, the the largest assumption underlying that is about whether or not recursive self improvement is possible and what's the speed of that. Um, in a theoretical world where you can get an AI which can then improve itself. Um, presumably, it's able to improve itself at a rate that's faster than than human engineers can improve it, um, and then as it gets better, it can presumably improve itself even faster, and it sort of you know becomes this exponential curve where suddenly it you know is light years ahead of the competition. In that sort of world, then hypothetically, the first AI that's able to reach recursive self improvement kind of by definition becomes the most powerful because unless there's you know an AI that's literally a few seconds behind it, uh, then you know in a matter of, of hours it's going to quickly outpace all other theoretical AIs, uh, crush them out of existence, you know, disable all of our cybersecurity protocols because it's just you know infinitely smarter than us. Um, and I think if you take that for granted, then then a lot of those concerns about uh, sort of the singularity and having one AI that sort of runs everything begin to make more sense. Uh, but but that's an assumption to be questioned, um, and and I don't think it at all seems uh, inevitable, at least that, that recursive self improvement is possible, or even if it is, uh, that it becomes this exponential curve. I mean, there's a lot of domains where as we get better at something, the next unit of improvement becomes exponentially harder. Um, you know, we're seeing that in Moore's law. Moore's law is slowing down because it's just getting, you know, chemically near impossible to just fit more transistors on like a micrometer. You know, um, and and it seems totally plausible that that would also be the case in terms of uh, self improvement for AI. Yeah, there's this underlying assumption that shows up in the in the literature about two kind of scenarios. Um, a fast takeoff versus a slow takeoff, which is all kind of. Do you see that recursive intelligence with like a hyper exponential up, upward curve that just so quickly outpaces anything else? Or will they become smarter at more of an evolutionary pace in the same way that, that human beings did, albeit on a faster time scale? Um, because if you, if you see a slow takeoff, you end up with um, uh, Andrew Ng, who's a, a Google AI researcher. He said that if it's a slow takeoff, worrying about super intelligent hostile AIs is a bit like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. Like, how about we get to Mars first and then we'll worry about the over overpopulation problem. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's a fast takeoff, then, well, no, you should because we're going to go from Mars to overpopulation in 
hours, minutes, yeah. seconds, you know, who knows, right? And by then it's too late. So there is that kind of baseline assumption about AI growth. And I, I don't think any of us are expert enough in the field to kind of uh, estimate a guess at what it is, but it's something for uh, our listeners to keep in mind. I think that's I think that's all we've covered the basic kind of overview of cool stuff going on in AI, some of the the interesting speculation about the, the future of AI. So Caleb, thanks for coming on the show to talk about that. Do you have anything that you're working on right now that our listeners would be interested in knowing about? Um, yeah, I mean, so at, in my work at R Street, I'm, I'm working a lot on artificial intelligence um, policy. Uh, I'm working on a paper right now specifically on, on competition policy in AI and kind of how do we think about, you know, is it just going to be Google and Amazon who are, you know, running all the AI systems or are there, you know, levers that we can pull now to sort of increase uh, at least the odds of, of, you know, healthy competition in the ecosystem? Uh, and some of those, uh, you know, policy barriers are things like what's the supply of data scientists? You know, if there's only, uh, you know, 10,000 scientists coming out of top universities every year, it's a lot easier for Amazon and, and Google to, you know, grab them all. Um, and, and specifically the number that are in the United States. So um, there, there's an op-ed I recently wrote that you could link in the show notes if you wanted to um, about sort of the importance of immigration uh, in, in the AI debate and the fact that we have a ton of really smart AI researchers that are coming through United States uh, universities. Um, and then because we're so backlogged uh, in high skill visa programs, uh, they're not able to stay here. Um, and especially uh, in a world where there is a you know fixed supply essentially of AI talent, um, there's sort of a zero sum international competition aspect where uh, you know every smart AI researcher we have is one less that China has. And while generally you know I think uh, a lot of the the China you know comparisons can be overblown, and it's probably not as concerning as some people make it out. I think generally I would prefer cutting edge AI to be developed in a democratic country. <laughs> <laughs> That's not implausible. Um, well, I think the number I remember from your article was, or somewhere, that um, 20 years ago, one in 10 Chinese like tech graduate students returned back to China who were a H-1B visa holder. Um, but that now that rate's gone down to eight out of ten go back to China. So like we've seen that real switch where there's the kind of the brain drain influx is starting to shift back towards China. This ties in for our listeners to a previous episode a week or two ago about um, the transformation of China, the tech industry, and how it's transforming both rural and urban China and the way in which they're actually attracting people who would have been engineers or executives at Yahoo and Google and Amazon who are now opting to leave just because they think the prospects for innovation are better in China now than in the US. So we're seeing, I think that ties back into that conversation that we had before. Uh, but until next week, be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.